Here are some little travel tips from Flats in Luxor. I hope they help you have a much more wonderful holiday. Now, there are various means of transport in Luxor. We have the international airport. We have um, a train system. We have buses that go cross-country. Uh, locally, we have taxis, kaleshes, um, also known as hand tours, and bicycles and walking. Now, at the airport, um, we receive both international and domestic flights. You can come here internationally on chartered flights from most European countries and there are also scheduled flights from European and Middle Eastern countries. When you arrive in Luxor you have to have a visa. Now if you're traveling on um, a, what can be loosely described as a Western passport, um, America, Europe, uh, Australasia, um, then you can get a visa on arrival for $15. It is worth checking with your local Egyptian embassy in case you've got any doubts. If you uh, arrive internally, uh, this is just a normal internal flight, um, and it can come from Sharm El Sheikh, Haggadah, Aswan or Cairo. Now, occasionally people have booked straight through and that means you arrive in the domestic terminal but your luggage goes to the international terminal so you stand there like an absolute nana looking at the domestic luggage terminal until you realize yours isn't coming up so if you're doing a straight through booking like this make inquiries at the domestic where you go to for the international luggage pickup um, the other thing worth bearing in mind is when you arrive internationally, there is a duty-free shop within the airport and this allows you to buy four bottles of spirits um, on landing. If you buy outside the airport, it's three bottles of spirits and the duty-free shop is at Karnak. Now this is in addition to any duty free you may have bought on the plane or at the uh, departure airport. This is not mega cheap but it is the only way to get imported spirits um, apart from through a hotel bar. So if you like your gin and tonic then buy your gin at the airport before you exit the airport door doors. Um, you'll see it straight in front of you. There's a sign saying 48 hours and uh, it gives you all the uh, allowances that you can get there. Train. Um, now the train is mainly used between uh, Cairo and Luxor and Aswan and Luxor. Uh, you can get a sleeper train. Uh, there's two little bunks in the room, there's a, a, a wash hand basin, it's quite small, um, and uh, at the end of the carriages there is a, a shared toilet. Um, there are also recliner seats, um, first class recliners. Um, you can travel on these recliner seats day and night. But actually, having said that, at the moment, and this is August 2011, you cannot officially travel on the day train, but lots of people do. They just get on board and pay. Um, but officially, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, the disadvantages, oh, they are many and oft. I hate meeting people off the train because I have waited hours and hours and hours for them to arrive. And when you arrive at the railway station at 5 a.m. and the train doesn't arrive until 10.30 a.m., it gives you a bit of a gruntled aspect when you meet your people. So this is not um, a reliable method of transport. Um, if you've got certain, you know, I mean, like if you're trying to do a day trip or something like that, you could find you've lost a lot of your day. The toilets are 
um, I don't know what me mechanism they use, but halfway through the journey they seem to run out of water and if the people before you have had Pharaoh's revenge then the toilets aren't too nice. You get food on the sleeper train um, the best way I can describe it is edible um, it's certainly not cuisine or tasty or anything like that. If you want to find out more about train times, prices um, up-to-date rules and regulations this website the man in seat 61 um, is excellent and I always send my people to it it's got photos of the trains the latest prices everything on there so you can pick up on there but if your budget al allows you to transfer between uh, Cairo and Luxor by plane I would do that um, with the Luxor Aswan thing, I would be more tempted to go by road because you can stop off on the sites on the way. Maybe if you're doing two transfers, you do one by road and one by train. It's only um, three and a half, four hours by train from Aswan to Luxor. Um, and that you tend to arrive uh, in the evening on that one. So it's not too bad. Um, that, that's, a, that's an okay travel. Bus. Oh, not recommended at all. Well, if you're coming to my flat, so I'm not going to meet you off the bus. I can tell you that for a start. Um, I travelled on it once. Um, I've got a story about it on my blog. I do not recommend it. Um, if you're, if the only way you can get from the Red Sea to Luxor is on the local bus, just don't drink for 24 hours beforehand and. Um, don't expect to be comfortable. Um, the air condition is often broken. Um, they stop at local toilets, squat toilets. No, it's, it's not nice. Not nice. Not nice. Um, if you are getting a taxi anywhere, I suggest the first thing you do is find out how much you should pay. And you should be able to ask where you're staying. I want to go to XYZ. How much should that cost me? So you've got a rough idea of the price, then you um, meet a taxi driver or he meets you and you agree on the price. Now this may take a little bit of time. Um, haggling is the way of life here and you, if you know that you are, have been given the correct price, to pay a little bit more because you're a tourist is acceptable but not to pay twice price should be. Now when you arrive at your destination pay that price and if he gives you a hard time or he says oh no that was only for one person or don't accept any of it. Um, he should uh, accept the price that you have agreed. Now to be honest with you 90% of the taxi drivers here are absolutely wonderful. But there are the odd rogues. And for that reason, I would suggest that you um, use recommended drivers. I personally have got a whole raft of drivers that I would trust with my life. Um, I, people who, um, just the other day, um, one of my guests lost his camera at Hatchet Soot, and the driver went back and found it for him and brought it back two hours later. So these are the kinds of drivers it's worth paying a little bit over the odds for. Um, if you are getting in a uh, hailed taxi and there are other people in the car or it looks as though other people want to get in the car, this is more applicable in, in Cairo. Don't share. Refuse to. Um, just get out of the taxi and say, I'm not prepared to share. And if you're a lady, you should never sit in the front with the driver. This is sending a signal that you probably don't want to send. You should always sit in the back um, and then he knows that you know that he knows that you know what the rules and regulations are and you'll be uh, a lot more safe from hassle. Kaleshes. Now these are the rather attractive horse-drawn carriages. Again, find out from your accommodation what sort of price you should pay. 
Now, agree a root. Now, this may sound a bit strange, but the, the way these cholesterols work is they'll take you from A to B via X, Y, and Z, which are all shops where they hope you're going to spend lots of money. Um, and the shop will give them a commission for um, bringing you to their shop. Now, this doesn't actually, funny enough, affect you because the price you pay in the shop will be the same whether you've been bought there by a Kalesh, a taxi, or you've made your own way. But it makes a lot of difference to the Kalesh driver. So if you're happy to go to the shops and the, or the local soup or whatever, then agree that. But if you're not, make it absolutely clear you will not pay if he takes you to any shops. And be categorical about it. Now, agree the price. They, they, some of them do do this thing of when you get out, out, oh, that was the price per person, or that was Nubian pounds, not Egyptian pounds, or that was English pounds, not Egyptian pounds. So agree the price for the whole group in the currency and only pay that price. Now here maybe come along with a bit of oh some backsheesh for the horse. You can give some backsheesh for the horse. It's nice to give some backsheesh for the horse. Um and uh you know backsheesh makes a lot of difference to them. But don't be forced into it if you're not happy with the service and tell him why you're not prepared to give him the money. Now, when you're using a Kalesh, try and look for a horse that looks as though it's got a bit of fat on it, a bit of meat. Um, look for a, a clean and tidy uh, Kalesh. Um, if the driver, if, if you're a big group, over four, use two Kaleshes. And if the driver wants to put you all in one Kalesh, say, no, I, I want to be kind to the horse. And also, don't let him uh, gallop or canter the horse. Just let him trot the horse. And never, ever, ever take a Kalesh from the east bank to the west bank. You have to go via the bridge, and this is far too far for the horse. It's not good for them. So be considerate to the horse. You have to understand these men are desperate for business, and they will possibly agree to things that aren't good for the horse. So it's really up to you to be um, a little bit sensible here and a bit animal friendly. This is one of the Kaleshes. Um, you can see they're quite colourful, they're quite good fun and, and they are a nice way to get about Luxor. Um, bicycles. A lot of people hire bicycles, especially on the West Bank, to go about the various sites. Now, um, this is fine, but in summertime, it is very hot here, really seriously hot, and I would suggest that only experienced cyclists go about in summertime. If it's, this is your first time on a bike since you were a teenager, summertime is not the time to do it. Um, take lots of water with you um, and make sure you, that you drink it. The bikes here are um, Chinese. They're, I wouldn't say they're the best quality in the world, and you won't find a lot of different sizes. They won't be like children's bikes or anything like that. So don't expect the kind of uh, quality that you might, like one of Boris's bikes in London. Test your bike out. Make sure it works. Just check the brakes, you know. Check that when you get on it, the seat doesn't go slamming down because they haven't tightened up the nuts. So just do a little circle round just to make sure it's all working. It's worth your while. They'll give you a lock and everything like that so that you can lock it up. And um, uh, you'll find plenty of places to, to put the bike safe. And it is a nice way of going around if you're fit um, and uh, you enjoy that kind of thing. Walking. Even more caveats here on summertime walking. Um, it is, um, you know, we are talking a lot of hills and mountains here, so you do need to be careful. Um, you need to know your way around. You can use Google Maps to get around, but I would uh, 
because of the level of hassle that you get, it is actually worthwhile hiring a local Egyptian to take you around because he'll ride shotgun for you and keep all the hassle away and he knows his way around. If you're interested in this, I have got a local Egyptian that I know whose Egyptology is not bad and he knows the hills like the back of his hand and can take you all around. So places like Thot Hill, that there's no way, I mean, we're talking about a three, four hour climb up the mountain. He knows how to get up there, the quickest route and everything. And he's taken quite a number of my guests up there. So like I say, it's worth having a guide just to keep the other people away from you. Um, on the Nile, well, you've got quite a few things on the Nile because obviously um, we're divided into East and West Bank. And to get from one to the other, you can go via the bridge, but the bridge is nine kilometres south of the town. So this means quite a, a long way round, you know, a good half an hour. Um, whereas if you're in the centre of town, you can get the ferry across 10 minutes and you've gone from one side to the other. Um, there are also motorboats on the Nile, felucas, dahabiers and sandals, and I'll go into a bit more detail. The ferry um, runs 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It is one Egyptian pound each way. Sometimes they will ask you if you are coming back and they'll give you a tiny scrap of paper that's written something on it. But that will work. It will work. Um, so if you pay two LE, that tiny scrap of paper will get you back again. It's a good way to meet the locals. Um, but these can be good and bad for you, so just be a little bit canny. Um, they can be friendly, helpful, useful, or they can be trying to um, take advantage of you. So just uh, use your head a little bit there. Um, but the ferry is very convenient. It goes from on the east bank, just outside Luxor Temple. You'll see it says National Ferry. And on the West Bank, um, there's a, a, a little area there at the end of the main road um, that's quite clear to see it from. That's the ferry boat. It's a new style one, and it's sort of meant to look a bit ancient Egyptian-y. Um, and that's the um, terminal there. You can see it's not particularly sophisticated, so um, keep an eye on young children, etc. Motorboats. Um, if you can't be bothered to wait for a ferry, um, like I said, about every 10 minutes, but late at night they can be 20, 25 minutes, um, you can go across on a motorboat, and there are loads of these at the ferry crossing. Um, you can either go straight across, um, you can use them to go to Karnak, which is quite a nice way to approach Karnak, to go over the water like the ancient Egyptians did, the pharaohs, when they went to Karnak. Um, you can use uh, the motorboat to go to King's Island. This used to be known as Crocodile Island, and it's the place where the um, mo old move and pick, it's now called the Jollyville, is situated. And that's quite a nice little trip along the Nile. Um, and sometimes the drivers can offer you a meal at sunset, which is really quite nice. Um, make sure you agree the price and what you are looking for. For example, going straight across the Nile, you probably pay about 10 Egyptian, um, depending on your bargaining skills. Um, but for an afternoon out or something like that, Again, worthwhile asking your accommodation what sort of price you should expect to pay. Um, do have some money for backsheesh, the tipping, because the uh, uh, captain will do the ma majority of the, the dealing with you, but you often have a boy that does the actual work, and these boys, the backsheesh makes a lot of difference to them. And often they can actually be the only working member in a family, so you really are chucking money into the local economy when you give them money. 
A feluca, very similar kind of thing. You can uh, have it as a day trip in Luxor. Um, you can go out for the whole day, an afternoon, just a couple of hours. You can have a sunset cruise. Um, it's a very, very, very pleasant um, time on the Nile. Um, sort out your price beforehand. For example, we, in 2011, we do a sunset dinner cruise for 20 US dollars per person. And that goes out, takes people to the island and um, feeds them, brings them back, and they get some great photographs. Again, remember the backsheesh, because here the boy will be doing quite a lot of work, running up and down the mast and everything. And sometimes, if there's no wind, these poor captains and boys have to row. Um, and it's really, really, really hard work. So please be generous with the backsheesh. These are some feluccas all tied up at just outside the Winter Palace. Um, looking for business and, and that's a place to um, pick up a felucca if you want to. Your accommodation may well provide one as well. We certainly do. Now, there is a way of cruising the Nile on a felucca, a sandal or a dahabia. And these cruises, these sailing cruises, run between Esna and Aswan or Aswan and Esna. Esna is very, very close to Luxor. I don't know why the government doesn't give the sailing boats a license to take people right into Luxor, but they don't. So when the sailing boat people say to you, Esna, um, that's as far as they can go. They have no choice about this. Now, uh, doing a felucca um, to and from Aswan, that's great for a backpacker kind of mentality if you're used to wild camping um, because there's no facilities. So um, if you want to wee, um, it's a bit tricky. Um, the food that they provide is excellent. Um, that it's, a, it's a really nice experience. But if you want luxury, a sandal or a dahabia. A sandal is a converted wide beam um, boat that was used for trading and that generally sleeps between six and eight. And a dahabia is a 10 to 12 berth um, boat and these are both sailing boats. Dahabia can be spelt a number of different ways. So um, don't worry, they're all valid. It's a transliteration into Arabic. And these are superb luxury. I did one for a birthday once and I just loved it. Um, we do that. We offer that under our uh, website sailthenile.com and you can see all the different methods that, and what the bedrooms look like and the crew and the food and everything on that website. So those are your options on the Nile. So I hope that's given you some insight into all the things that you can do um, in Luxor, how you get here, how you can get about, and uh, both on the roads and the trains, the planes and the river. Thank you for watching.